Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on The Cognitive Crucible is Sharon Russell, who is the Engagement Branch Chief and Deputy Division Chief of the Allies and Partners Force Development Division of the Joint Staff Directorate for Force Development, or J7, in Suffolk, Virginia. This division helps collaborative force development capabilities between the joint force and allies and partners through coordinated engagements to prevail in competition and conflict. She has also led and participated in numerous crisis response operations during her 21 years of service in the United States Coast Guard Reserve. Sharon Russell, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Good morning. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, this is exciting for me. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, I, I, I guarantee, Sharon, uh, that our audience is going to really appreciate your experience in hearing about what, what you've done uh, uh, in related to crisis response uh, in, in other uh, matters. Uh, and also to our audience, I'd like to just say that um, keep in mind that Sharon's opinions are her own and do not reflect the uh, policies of the Coast Guard or any other U.S. government organization for that matter. So the conversation that I'd like to have with you today, Sharon, will cover emergency management and allies and partner force development. But before we get into these topics, could we start by getting your assessment of our strategic landscape, or if you prefer, the times in which we live? Uh, excellent. Yes, thank you for all of that. I'll, I'll launch into this by also saying that I'm um, recognizing the focus of this is, is information, information management. I'm, I'm not an information management professional. I definitely have my footing more in, um, in emergency management, incident management, uh, but the more time I spend in that world, the more I recognize the importance of, of information. And I'll, I'll say that no matter what I do, whether it's as a civilian or as a reservist, the one thing everybody always says that could go better is communication. So during emergencies or incidents or even planned events, uh, whether it's a, an engagement with a, an international ally or partner, senior leadership, or a, a hurricane response, at the end of the day, Everybody always says, well, we can improve on our communications and communications at its foundation is information sharing. So as we as we look at um, on the emergency management side, as, as we look at an increase in, in events, heavy weather events, um, they're all going to require more, more government attention at all levels. They're going to require interorganizational efforts. Uh, these are these are all things that we're going to have to do to work together. Nobody, no one organization can handle everything on their own. And with that in mind, uh, there are systems in place that I think really help facilitate that inner organizational work. And I don't think everybody is uh, aware of them. Um, and I talk specifically about the incident command system, which I would love to see used a lot more. Um, communications these days can break down physically in terms of actual equipment that we're using, radios or networks, uh, but then they can also break down uh, in terms of, of actual information shared. So we're talking about even um, simple things. We, you know, well, I'm, we're going to meet the, the delegation at the door. Well, which door? And so if you send everybody to the front door and they're coming in the back door, well, now you're off, everybody's off and it doesn't work. But um, this can even be things like um, rumor control during a, a, a man-made disaster of some kind. Well, what happened? Well, how many people have been hurt and what's the status? And 
And especially in today's society, you know, the 24 hour news cycle changed the way we approach information sharing and social media changed it again. And AI is changing it again uh, in ways that are, are, we're not even sure that we can completely wrap our head around it. And so um, I think we really need to take a, a close look about how we share information with whom, when, uh, who is doing the sharing. And all of these things are important, whether you're talking about internal to response or external to stakeholders, government agencies, non-governmental agencies, volunteer organizations, the public, the media, everybody needs to have a, a better idea of, of how and of how we're sharing information. Mm, right. It, it, you know, to, to your last point there, it seems to me that your assertion there can be even generalized well beyond um, uh, emergency management, just to to day to day life. I mean, so, something that I've noticed here fairly recently. And by the way, we are recording this on uh, September fourth, twenty twenty four. Um, this episode might not come out for several weeks, but what I'm about to say still applies. Um, sometime over the last six months or so, I've noticed. So, so I'm. I'm an iPhone user, but something I've noticed is that within, you know, like switching back and forth between apps, sometimes I, you know, select text and then copy it into the browser or, or back and forth but between apps. And something I've started noticing is that more and more apps these days are popping up a little warning, like, um, you know, please, please verify that you want to paste this into this other app, right? Mm -hmm. And that gets to your point about information sharing, right? Uh, so e even just like in a general sense, the sharing of information uh, mm -hmm. is becoming increasingly uh, something that is uh, being called out as something people should be considering. Uh, do, do you kind of get what I'm saying? I do. I'm, I'll, I'll confess, I'm not an iPhone user. I'm definitely a... a, a <laughs> a Samsung kind of girl. I, I have an iPhone, but that's just because uh, that's what's been issued to me. But but sure, I understand it. And sometimes um, you get warnings. Are you sure you want to copy and paste that information? Or um, or what if you what if you do want to copy and paste information, but you don't grab the whole phrase? Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, I'm searching for I'm searching for something, but it's got two or three words in it and I only capture part of it. Well, now you end up searching for something else. It's all yeah. Yeah. It right. And, and 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 putting stuff into a large language model um mm -hmm. uh app or something. Yeah, pe right. pe people are starting to get tuned into, well, you know, better not share proprietary corporate information into Absolutely. a free whatever LLM, <laughs> even though you get something immediately back, which may be helpful uh over the long run that kind of sharing of information could be, you know, detrimental to whatever, you know, corporate goals or, you know, strategy and things like this. You know, and we'll see that. So when I, when I work emergency responses, especially if it's a, I'll call it a man-made disaster versus a natural disaster. So my 20, almost 22 years now uh, in the Coast Guard, and even as a civilian, I had a long, uh, a long stint doing, emergency response work for the oil and natural gas industry. So much of what all of these organizations have is proprietary, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, where equipment is, oil refining facilities or how they work or mm -hmm. communication systems or product information that they're managing. All of these things can be proprietary. And if we shift uh, to using large language models or AI to develop press releases, for example. If we want, if we want AI's help to figure out what the public needs to know and rapidly develop press releases or talking points for, um, for leadership to use or articles that we want to push out. And we inadvertently, because as a responder, our, I, I need to know, I need to know what am I dealing with? So a pipeline has leaked or a facility a tank has broken or something like that, right? And I, I need, as a responder, I need to know. 
I need to know what the product is. I need to know where it's stored. I need to know how it's transported. I have to have the details from so that I can respond to the incident. But I have to be very careful because that's still proprietary and I can't. So much of what we produce during an incident is open to a FOIA request. Okay, so now, it, okay, well, like, yes, but it's not really sold to the public, but I still need to know. So where are we going to store it? And how are we going to use it? And where can I publish it? And it gets a little, yeah. when we did everything on paper and we could just put the papers in a box and file them. It's, it's wow, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, my, that's it. This is its own, you know, major topic thread, <laughs> uh, but we 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 haven't really started getting into what the um, the uh, uh, major or the uh, primary content of this this uh, uh, episode. So um, perhaps you can talk, Sharon, a little bit about your background in emergency management and incident response, and give kind of like an overview over the last uh, twenty years of you know what what this problem space has looked like and, and maybe how it's changed all right i uh i joined the coast guard in 2002 and uh and my first assignment on active duty was in homa louisiana when i graduated from officer candidate school uh the director of the school said yeah homa louisiana huh well it's not the end of the world but you can see it from there that's so good. if you go to New Orleans and, and head southwest, and there's nothing out there, there is now, but 20 plus years ago, there was nothing out there uh, except oil fields. And my entire purpose was to learn to clean up oil. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go someplace warm uh, and learn to clean up oil. And, and South Louisiana is the best place to learn to do that. And the Coast Guard approaches emergency management uh, sort of... I'll say generally, which is to say that if you can effectively manage an oil spill response and the training and exercises for that and the response plan writing for that, then you can apply those skills generally to any kind of incident. And I agree with that, which is to say that if you can manage, if you can use this incident command system and we can spend some time on that to to manage an oil spill, you can also use it to manage a hurricane response or a vessel grounding or a wildfire or a terrorist attack. It's all the same uh, management by objectives. There's, that, there's, there's, there's some generalization that can be there, done. There are generalizations. Uh, you always need your subject matter experts. Please don't, don't misunderstand that. You always need your subject matter experts, your technical specialists for sure. But the but the overall management uh, of an incident is is fairly consistent. And so I've responded to, like I said, oil spills, hurricanes, bridge elisions, uh, vessel, vessel collisions, vessels in themselves, uh, all of the above. I've done large scale planned events. The Republican National Convention was in Tampa in 2012. I coordinated the maritime security for that lot of water in and around Tampa and the convention center where the actual convention was held, the media center, all of that had a Coast Guard nexus to it. So coordinating 20 plus agencies and the and the res their response posture and readiness uh, ooh, was ooh, a big thing. Yeah. So and most recently I, I just came back from Baltimore. Uh, for the the key bridge. Oh, so so I, can can I just in, inject one small thing? So I I guess that's something that I had not really considered with emergency management. Um, is there's there's an aspect to this. Even if an emergency doesn't happen, it's just have you know having having the plan in place in case of an emergency. So Absolutely. there's 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 actual execution, but then there's just the the background planning and having a plan at the ready in case something does happen. So even for, for all of these major events that are happening, let's just say worldwide, the Olympics, the Super Bowl, uh, the, the uh, presidential inauguration, <laughs> all of these major events, uh, even though most of them don't have some kind of an emergency that people are aware of, at least there's the planning that goes into the event as well. Sure, yeah, you know, right, absolutely. And I, I think a lot of people don't 
don't realize, which is why I, I like to talk about emergency management and not mm -hmm. emergency response. The response is just one piece of the entire planning uh, timeline, which is to say mm -hmm. that you start with planning and preparedness, maybe even prevention, especially when it comes to security, like the, like the inauguration or the State of the Union address or a Super Bowl, any of these large events. The, the intent ideally is to keep the bad thing from happening, mm -hmm. which is why we carry clear bags of a certain size and to major sporting events now and you can't just take a backpack that nobody can see right this is why we have metal detectors at airports all of these things now is to prevent a bad thing from happening there are steps you can take to mitigate if the bad thing happens but it's everything from having trained response professionals nearby in case there's a medical i just I just did a ran a 10 mile race uh, on Sunday and there were EMTs all along, right? They, they don't want anybody to have heat stroke, but there's mitigation measures in place, right? Whether it's, um, you know, flood control options, anything like that mitigation, then you actually have the response piece and then you'll have a recovery piece on the end and all of it has to be planned for. One of my favorite um, planning pieces that I did. So when the Republican convention was in Florida in August in 2012, that's the height of hurricane season. It just is. Hurricane season runs from June to the end of November. And August and September are always our hot months uh, in the Southeast United States. And so I put together a hurricane plan. We had all kinds of uh, waterborne assets of different sizes on the water, running security along bridges and, uh, and roadways and around the convention center. But if heavy weather were to have come through... I can't have a tiny little small boat on the water that's dangerous. So it was a matter of, okay, well, what's the order that we're gonna bring the boats in? And where are all of the boat ramps? And how long is it gonna to take to trailer them to the to the can the state fairgrounds? And does is there room to store all of them? Because we had boats in from across Florida, right? We can't, they're not all going back. All of this stuff had to be laid out, planned out. More than yeah. one person me like I had three heads, right? Why are you worried about this? As it turned out, Hurricane Isaac very nearly came and ruined everything. And, everything when, and when, when when was Hurricane Isaac? That was September 2012. Okay, yeah. It ended up going to New Orleans. But there was a chance that it was going to turn right and uh, and come into, come oh, into Tampa, Tampa instead. Yeah, wow. And it didn't. We were lucky, but I had a plan in case we needed it. Okay, so do you think maybe we could start getting a little bit more into the information side of the project? Well, first of all, all, all of this is related to information, but uh, specifically within the incident command system, what are the kinds of information capabilities that are resident there? Uh, I'll send just a, a hot second in case listeners aren't familiar with the incident command system. It's a sure. um, it's an organizational framework that uh, that allows for we like to call it a management by objective. So it's a it sets up um, an organizational chart with roles and responsibilities that allow a response team to. Uh, acknowledge current events, uh, current actions to respond while still planning for the next, we call an operational period to make sure that the unified command, the, the leadership of, of the response, and that's usually the federal agency, a state agency, maybe a responsible party, they all come together and decide what do we have to do over the next 24 hours or over the next week, depending on the type of response and where you are. And they lay out their objectives and then the team comes through and lays out strategies and tactics and orders resources. And there's a whole process in place that ensures that we get what we need and then revisit it. It's an OODA loop, essentially. Um, it's, a, it's a planning structure that, that allows for uh, organization, it allows to, to bring organization to chaos, right? We like to bring order out of chaos is, is what the incident command system does. And it's, it's a federal program. Uh, Homeland Security is aware of it. Most of your local fire uh, departments are aware of it. Um, 
National Guard is aware of it. Uh, Department of Defense is not as aware of it. They have their own planning systems in place. Uh, so when you try to, to combine those two agencies, Department of Defense and Homeland Security, there's there's some tension there. And yeah. we can talk a little bit about that. But within the structure... But, uh, this, this, this is a system that is ha has some integration across some agencies and um, presumably a like a historical repository where lessons learned can be drawn Absolutely. upon and things along Absolutely. these lines. Wow. Absolutely. Cool. 100%. Yeah. No, it's cool. It's been around since the seventies. It was actually started by the uh, fire service out in California. So uh, you, the, the fire service in California realized when they were fighting multiple fires simultaneously, that um, somebody would order a resource and say, hey, I need a fire truck over here. They weren't being specific about what kind of fire truck they needed. Uh, and and tasking was getting duplicated or ignored because they thought somebody else was doing it. It was, it was just kind of a mess. So they put a system in place to, to organize their response. And that's that's the crux of the incident command system. Uh, FEMA uses it almost exclusively, and it's it's a flexible system. Um, it's designed to help capture documentation and to uh, organize their response. So uh, I'm a big fan of it. I've seen it work. Uh, a lot of people aren't familiar with it, and they don't know how it works or why, but, but I support it. So one of the things that the incident command system allows for are different um, different elements to focus on on different priorities. Specifically, in this case, we'll usually have a joint information center, which is what we're going to try to get to here in this podcast. So we also can talk about uh, you know a legal group that is focused, or a security group that's focused on some things, or you know, safety is always a big thing. But there's also an information management piece to all of this, and it's the Joint Information Center. And the Joint Information Center has guidelines and um, best practices that are outlined that say who should be in the Joint Information Center, what qualifications might you need for the person that's going to run it, which agencies should be represented. What are their primary and secondary foci? What products are they supposed to be developing? All of these sorts of things are in handbooks and lessons learned, and it comes with a bunch of training. And so it's designed to be staffed by public affairs officers or public information officers. And because it's an integrated system, it's going to have staff in there from the federal agency that's leading this, the state agency that's involved. You know, take an oil spill. We're going to talk about your local emergency management or your local, the Department of Environmental Protection, whatever it is for that state. Um, you're probably going to have um, maybe the governor's office is going to have mm -hmm. representation mm -hmm. in there. There's or, a there's there's a diverse set of uh, stakeholders that don't yes. always fall under the federal or right. the U.S. government purview. Yeah. And so everybody should be on board. And the intent is so that there's one message, whatever that is, we're all saying the same thing uh, consistently, because what the public does not need is to hear different stories and, and different facts and different they, they don't need that that's not helpful it needs if you're going to get support from the public and if you want to keep the public and stakeholders informed the way we should messaging should be consistent and if you truly implement a joint information center and everybody is in there everybody sees the products and everybody can uh, put their two cents in and uh, ensure that the messaging is what it needs to be and that it's consistent. And it's, it's a critical element of wow. the entire response. Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, uh, a real touch point, I'm sure with, uh, uh, you know, other like military information operations or even corporate, corporate messaging, right. Uh, uh, wanting to be sure that there's some consistency or some, through line to to be sure that the message is um, harmonized across a, a, a real sprawling 
uh, set of stakeholders. It can be very detrimental if if the if the governor says one thing and the general says something else. Mm. It can be. Um, yeah, it, that's 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 like hours of of <laughs> of of CNN and 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 yeah, yeah uh, cable cable news, it, you know, uh, follow ups and uh, terrible, you know, snippet replays, uh, side by side TikToks, you know, uh, <laughs> he said this, she said that, or what, you know, all that on and on and on. That's like, yeah, that's just makes 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 an already challenging situation harder, especially when you're talking about an emergency. So this is, mm. so it's one thing if we're talking about a planned event, a, a Super Bowl, you know what messaging is going to go out there. I mean, you can start on the on the far side of the timeline and you can message from early on. If you've got a ticket, this is what you can bring into the stadium and this is what you can expect when you get here. And this is, this is the evacuation plan if we have to do anything, all the things. You can message that well in advance. But if you're talking about an emergency incident, if you're talking about something that has just happened. Um, and like I said, most recently, I just came from Baltimore when the uh, motor vessel Dolly hit the key bridge and it collapsed. Mm -hmm. This sort of thing, and nobody was planning for this. No, nobody expected this. Um, there was no time. The 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 timeline is, is sped up so rapidly. You have the, the information management piece has to happen at the speed of light to, to tell the public what's going on before the rumors start, before um, the, the conspiracy theories get going, uh, all of that, it's just, it happens so fast. Mm. Yeah, well, I would love to hear more about your your role. So what, what was your role in, in the key bridge incident and just what was it like? And, and, and how do you connect any of those dynamics to, you know, this podcast forum and the information environment and managing, it was, managing uh, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, a, it was a unique response. <laughs> Excuse me. It was a unique response. Uh, I was on the response for uh, a month. Uh, right about four weeks or so. And um, my primary role there was what we call a deputy incident commander. Uh, I was there in uniform uh, as uh, on active duty orders in the Coast Guard uh, activated reservist for the response. And the the incident commander for the Coast Guard was uh, was a captain and I was there as his backup. And my role in that, uh, my responsibilities in that role were to sort of keep things going internal to the command post, uh, if you will, while he really had a chance to focus up and out dealing with external stakeholders. Uh, and it was everything from, you know, building security to interacting with our joint information center, reviewing press releases and uh, ensuring that our senior leaders were prepared for any um, interviews that they were going to do and, and coordinating visits and congressional delegations and this sort of thing uh, that people wanted to do. Um, it was a fascinating response. One of the things that I found really interesting about the response that made communications and information management more challenging was the size of the unified command itself. So in a traditional incident command system, the unified command, the senior leadership is generally made up of three organizations. Like I said, you're going to have your lead federal agency. So if you've got an oil spill in the water, you're going to have the Coast Guard. You're going to have the local state agency for environmental protection, whatever that is. And you're going to have the owner of the oil, whether it was a pipeline or a vessel, whatever it is, that responsible party, that industry representative. What about like FEMA or DHS or does the Coast Guard represent DHS in... It that becomes an authority and jurisdiction thing. So depending on the type of incident and geographically where it is, your federal agency could be FEMA for uh, a hurricane. It could be the EPA if it was a, um, a spill or a hazmat release inland. It could be the Coast Guard if it's on the navigable waterway. That that just depends on the, on the jurisdiction assigned. Uh, any one of those organizations can represent Homeland Security. Uh, in that respect. 
So, uh, but in the key bridge response, we actually had six agencies in our unified command, double the number that we usually have. And they all had a reason to be there. So we had actually two federal agencies. The Coast Guard was there. This is obviously a river, a navigable waterway that's Coast Guard jurisdiction and the Army Corps of Engineers. The bridge, uh, the Army Corps is responsible for the bridge and the, and the seabed floor, keeping that open and free from uh, hazards. In this case, a, a bridge that was now underneath the, it was over the water and now it's <laughs> Okay, yeah. Right, so uh, so they're responsible for dredging and keeping the channel clear. So the Army Corps of Engineers, we had two federal agencies. I had three state agencies. It wasn't just the Department of Emergency Management for the city of Baltimore, but also environmental protection and also the Maryland State Police. The Maryland State Police were there because they have responsibility for notifying next of kin. And uh, mm. we lost seven uh, people um, in that disaster, seven people were killed. And so as we continued to recover um, their remains, the Maryland State Police was responsible for notifying next of kin. So they were also involved. And then we had the, the responsible party that was there representing the, the owner of the vessel. So we had six different entities. What about like the, the uh, Department of Justice or the FBI uh, investigating... They were absolutely involved. There were three, at least at least three different investigations happening simultaneously. And the FBI was one of them, but they were not part of the unified command. I they see. were running sort of a concurrent um, I see. specific investigation, the, investigation. They, they would be considered somehow adjacent to the ongoing uh, emergency management efforts. I see, yeah. And the investigation piece of that is always an ongoing element. So when you talk about managing an, an incident, there's a lot that goes into it. It's it's communicating it with the public, it's ordering resources, it's taking care of the responders, it's um, facilitating commerce, it's uh, planning ahead, it's managing the the budget, the finances, and understanding what the costs are going to be. It's 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 a very complex and complicated evolution. Uh, and so this this the investigations piece of that um, was happening as as an over, uh, operational element. Right, and but and and then there's even uh, yeah, so we we had a a, a pregame on, on this, but then there's the uh you know just managing chaos actors i guess <laughs> you know pe people who uh well i i guess it could just be people who are curious uh, like if it's like the best putting the best spin on it but you know people flying drones into the area of operations just to check it out right and uh that's that's got to be managed but but also there's people doing that for uh, you know, bad purposes too. So there's, there's, you know, almost like a, a defensive aspect to, to managing this as well. And, and drones are a relatively new addition to the response world. And they are an amazing asset to have. Uh, we've used drones post natural disasters before we send responders uh, or people, just the public, back into an area, we can send a drone and determine conditions of the roadways, for example. Um, yeah. Huge. And, and just increases our safety element uh, infinitely. It's it's an amazing asset. And in the key bridge response, we had our own drone operators. Um, so we get a better idea of where the containers were and the status of containers and the stability of the vessel. And uh, But we had to ultimately put a no-fly zone around a federal no-fly zone around the response site to keep other drones out. And we had to keep them out for a couple of reasons. One was a safety reason. We're flying our own drones and we have cranes operating in the area. I don't need another thing flying around there that that's dangerous, right? It could impact operational safety. Uh, but again, you, one of the other pieces is that we were also concerned um, if we did recover remains and we did throughout the response, fortunately, all seven people who were lost in the incident, their remains were recovered and returned to their families. But that doesn't need to be drone footage, right? That's right. really public. That's 
that doesn't need to be out there. Um, and we went, we, the incident, the Unified Command went all the way up to the Secretary of Homeland Security to get permission to establish uh a security zone, an air security zone, not just a no-fly zone, but an actual security zone uh, so that we could pursue criminal charges for people that flew drones into that area uh, when they weren't supposed to. <clears throat> wow. Wow. Uh, and you, you'd presumably, you'd also need the uh, to, to have available on a moment's notice, you know, um, evasive or not, not, not evasive, but uh, counter, counter drone Yep. abilities in, in order to enforce the no-fly zone and we did we had to bring those in as amazing well. amazing it, again and so these are resources that are available yeah. and united states as a whole we've used those resources um uh, mostly for planned political events like a state of the union or an inauguration right these things are planned we know about them we need to keep drones out it, okay fine we had to follow that same process, but for an incident response, which hadn't been done before. They bring in those same resources, those countered UAS yeah. systems and experts yeah. uh, in, a, in a situation where we'd not, I at least had not used them before. Mm -hmm. Wow. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Adding well, relevant. well. so we, we have the benefit of some hindsight right now, this, this incident. I'm sorry. It's uh, I'm I'm blanking on when this was. W was this like just one year ago, approximately? The the, the key no, bridge? this was just April. A April of 2024. Okay, well, six months. Um, um, there's a little bit of hindsight then. So what what's what's your hot wash on this? What what are some things that that you think could have been done better? And you know how how might these improvements actually get um, actualized? The, the, I think that the, the biggest challenge to information management during the Keybridge response was a confluence of uh, divergent priorities. So with that in mind, like I mentioned, we had six different organizations that were uh, in the Unified Command. And each agency had its own um, priorities and its own focus and its own, um, I would say, stakeholders or, or messaging they wanted to get out to the public. And it was not synced well among the leadership. And, uh, and there's, um, that made building consistent messaging very difficult. Mm. I think a lot of that uh, came from uh, a lack of understanding between and among the agencies on what each agency needed and what each agency wanted to accomplish. So the Army Corps of Engineers uh, was very, they were forward looking. Uh, and I, I don't disparage them. I completely understand what they wanted to accomplish. They were very forward looking. And by that, I mean, they knew that ultimately they were going to have to rebuild this bridge. And in order to rebuild the bridge in coordination with the state of Maryland, please don't, you know, we're not taking mm -hmm. the state of Maryland from transportation out of this, right? They're obviously, this is their bridge. Uh, but the Army Corps of Engineers knew that they were going to have to build a bridge, they were going to need money from Congress to do it. And so they were ready to consistently tell their good news story and get in front of Congress and tell them what a great job they're doing and how they can accomplish this. And oh, by the way, can I have a gajillion dollars? That would be great. Yeah, yeah. The Coast Guard, that was not their focus, right? That's, uh, yes, the bridge would be great. That's important. Everybody needs it. We're all going to use it. Okay, fine. Uh, but that wasn't the Coast Guard's focus, right? Our, our focus was environmental protection. Our focus was opening the waterway, uh, reestablishing uh, commerce, um, ensuring the, the safety, not getting the, the, um, the goods that were on board um, in and out of the 
city in the port of Baltimore, we just had a, we had a very different, I don't want to say more narrow focus, but maybe a more current ops focus. And so these things, these two things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, but the Coast Guard in my 22 years of experience, and I reiterate, this is just my opinion, the Coast Guard, uh, in my opinion, does a really terrible job of of doing that forward-looking communications piece. We tend to focus uh, on, on staying reactive and only addressing the incident at hand and the immediate work that's happening. And we're, we're really good about um, just pushing good news stories and sticking to the talking points that everybody has already agreed to. And those generally are focused on safety and, uh, and um, progress of the response. Mm -hmm. The Army Corps is definitely more focused on Yes, we're doing all these really great things now. So how are we going to get ahead of all of this? And the messaging was just not, wasn't synced. It wasn't timely. The Coast Guard is also generally risk adverse uh, when it comes to communications, I have found. So they're more slow to roll out stories. They're, uh, they want everybody's buy-in. They want to make sure that everybody is on board with the messaging. It takes longer to get everybody to agree to things it's uh it's just not a very rapid fire environment mm -hmm. for the coast guard and so trying to coordinate all of that if we if we had had the opportunity to better understand everybody's priorities and focus and how each agency reviews and approves press releases for example i think we could have done a lot better job about getting information out to the public more quickly mm -hmm. well so as as you're describing all of that i'm conjuring a scene in my head of uh you know the, the uh there's 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 going to be a press event where you know the you know the incident response team is going to share the latest updates right and there's the person who is maybe in charge of of the entire operation what what did you call it sharon the uh, unified incident command commander. yeah the, the commander, yeah. Command. yeah so there's the incident commander unified command that is maybe the lead person for this press um press conference but behind that person usually there's a representative from one or more of these um you know other stakeholder groups right and so preparing the talking points and everything for that whole, you know, 30 minute event or hour, you know, press event, that is just probably hours and hours of, <laughs> of trying to, you know, like determine what is it that we're going to say. But, but it, in the meantime, everything is unfolding and things are happening in yeah. real, real time that also needs to be somehow fed. It, it, there's a question in there somewhere. I, I, I guess one of the questions I, I, I have would be, is, is it possible to take the key talking points or, or the key priorities from each of the stakeholders, as you were just describing, the uh, you know, Coast Guard has its own narrow priority, the Army Corps of Engineers has its own you know, uh, desires and priorities, but taking all those priorities and like munging them into, you know, Create for me a a a a press conference talking points that that honors all of this, so that we can kind of cover everything, not leave anybody out, but also prioritize it in a way that makes sense according to the unfolding uh, dynamics. Do you kind of get what I'm asking? Or, that would be great, and that would yeah. and that would be great, and that is the intent. I go back to the Joint Information Center. Mm -hmm. Everybody has representation in there, and they don't always. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we have a better chance of of creating that and taking advantage of resources that we have now that we didn't before. So these AI large language models, if you can put in a bunch of stuff, uh, it can help develop that more quickly. And I, I don't think, I know the Coast Guard isn't taking advantage of it. I don't know that the Army Corps is really taking advantage of it. I didn't see it used on the key bridge response. We were 
we were dependent upon people and their experience and what they were garnering uh, from conversations and what our public affairs specialists who are trained to do this thought would be the best message to get out or the best talking point to, to gin up. Um, you know, I, one of the other points that we were debating during the response was um, everybody loves a picture, right? Pictures worth a thousand words. And so we want to develop graphics to show people things uh, and publish it. Mm -hmm. so they can be, you know, what waterways are open, for example. And there were several pieces out there that the Coast Guard did not want released to the public and the Army Corps of Engineers said, well, why not? And then they would get released. Like, well, but, but this is a joint information center. This is a unified command. Didn't we talk about this before this showed up on Facebook? No, we didn't? Okay, well, I guess it's out there now. And it happened a couple of times. And we kept saying, we, help us help you. You know, we had our reasons for not wanting to release this information or publish that graphic or use that term. We, you know, and it was, um, well, why not? <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was a it was a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Well, my goodness. Um uh this has just been like a crash course in uh emergency management and in event response. Uh uh obviously there's just so many so many rabbit trails to 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 go down and explore. Uh but yeah, thank you Sharon for you know just giving us a peek into this very complex uh, world um, that you've been inhabiting for uh, quite some time now. Um, but uh, all good things must end and, and this episode must start winding down. Uh, but uh, do, do you think we could you know, close out in our usual manner? So I, I, I like to ask if uh, you might have a a, a research question or something that an interested student might explore if they want to help advance the state of the art or, uh, you know, what's needed in this problem space? Uh, absolutely. I would like to, so, so I think the intent is to be able to um, develop communications strategies more rapidly uh, in an incident response so that we're better prepared to address um, the, the emerging situations. And so I'd be curious to go back over the past 20, 30, 50 years and have a better understanding of what messages worked, what didn't, um, and try to build uh, a measures of performance and measures of effectiveness for communication strategies, both man-made and natural disasters, so that we can implement them more quickly uh, going forward. One of the one of the things that I think is important is that I don't think people I don't think emergency managers really fully understand and appreciate the importance of information management. And I would love for information management professionals to understand that they have a role to play in emergency management. And so I would like to see uh, the, the themes of communication strategies over the years and what worked and what didn't and how we can um, build better uh, comm strategies going forward. Wow. Okay. Yeah, no, that is, um, I, I, I think, right in the uh, sweet spot of uh, things that are needed uh, throughout a bunch of different problem spaces, you know, not just emergency management and incident response, but um, <clears throat> even um, uh, course of action development for uh, military operations um, and uh, uh, things like that. It sounds like it's kind of a similar um, research problem. Uh, so very cool. Um, could you also, Sharon, recommend to our audience uh, a book or maybe an online resource that uh, touches upon these kinds of themes, or it, it could just be something that that you're reading currently that you think the audience might find interesting. Uh, 
you know, the, the resources that, that I would encourage people to look for online would be <clears throat> to head to the FEMA website and start to wrap their head around the incident command system if they're not familiar with it. Um, I think that the more we use that system, uh, at least in domestic responses, the better off we'll be <clears throat> because it is a, a well-established organizational structure for managing responses and to help people uh, understand their roles in an incident and how they can fit in. I I tend not to read. Uh, my bedside book stack is very high. Uh, and so I tend not to read for work when I have the, the chance. And so Personally, my stack of books includes uh, Catch-22 right now by uh, by Joseph Heller. I'm, I'm finally, it, it is, it, you know, the more you look at it, there's definitely a lot of communications uh, challenges in the book if you haven't read it. Uh, I never did. So uh, the, the miscommunication pieces that are actually highlighted in the book are fascinating. So although I'm reading it for pleasure, I think it is, uh, I think it is a relevant resource at this point. Is that right? Okay, excellent. Yeah, and you're, you're playing catch up. From from I, from from your high school uh, reading I, assignments. I did. I tried to read it once. It was not a required reading in high school, and, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, yeah. but but I did want to actually get around to it. So I'm enjoying it very much now. Well, Sharon, this has been a, a dynamite conversation, uh, super relevant uh, to today's operating environment in a number of contexts, right? Uh, so thank you, uh, so much for sharing your experience and insights with, uh, 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 emergency management and incident response. And with that, Sharon Russell, thank you so much for being a guest on the Cognitive Crucible. It has been my pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.